All righty, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for tuning on in. Today we're going to be talking about high-speed rail in the great state of New Mexico. Let's get going. So before we get too far into the weeds, I'm going to give you a brief outline of the video. It's going to be four sections. First section, I'm going to be talking about the impetus drive and why I'm making this video. In the second part, I'll be talking about the current state of the art of rail transit in the state of New Mexico, throughout the United States, and throughout the world. Next, I'll be talking about what system would benefit New Mexico the most. There are various kinds of rail transit, and we'll hit on all of them and discuss the advantages and disadvantages. Then finally, I'll be talking about how to drive this system to fruition, and where do we go from here to make this a reality. Let's get going. So, why am I making this video? Well, first of all, I love trains. I've loved trains since I was three years old. I've never really gotten over that. I mean, I'll ride trains any chance I get. Trains are awesome for a lot of reasons. First of all, you don't have to drive, so you can devote your attention to reading a book or getting work done or looking out the window as opposed to worrying about driving or getting hit by other drivers, which segues into the second reason why trains are awesome. They're so much safer. Third reason, they're so much cleaner. There's less CO2 emissions per passenger mile when you're riding a train. Fourth reason, Trains consume less energy per passenger mile. Believe it or not, we have a finite amount of oil and gas in this country. The sooner we can wean ourselves off it, the better. So the next reason for making this video is to raise awareness for what's going on in the round building in Santa Fe. Currently, a state representative by the name of Bill Souls has introduced two bills to talk about high-speed rail in New Mexico. The first bill would allow $500,000 for a feasibility study in building high-speed rail in New Mexico. The second bill would appropriate $1 billion to build rail from the southern border of New Mexico to the northern border. There aren't a lot of requirements, but we'll talk about that later on in the video. So what is our current situation as far as rail transit goes in the state of New Mexico? Well, we do have Amtrak that runs from Las Vegas through Albuquerque west all the way to LA. Additionally, a short section of Amtrak Sunset Limited runs through the southwestern portion of New Mexico and it's Amtrak and it's not a cell on. Our other form of rail transit in this state is the Rail Runner, which functions as a commuter rail. The Rail Runner runs from Berlin all the way to Santa Fe. It does a great job as far as commuter rail. However, from a time standpoint, all those routes in New Mexico aren't terribly competitive with driving. Sure, they can compete, but they don't surpass driving as far as drive time goes. And while the Rail Runner may be relatively cheap and it saves you money on parking, especially in Santa Fe, the price and schedule of Amtrak may be prohibitive to a lot of folks. Throughout the United States, high-speed rail and higher-speed rail is in various stages of development. In the Northeast, Amtrak's Acela Corridor is the poster child for what rail could and should be throughout the rest of the United States. Seriously, along the Acela Corridor, two to three trains run every single hour between D.C. and New York. It's both faster and cheaper than driving or flying. California is in the process of constructing high-speed rail, but they have been for the past seven years and they haven't got their initial operating segment up and running. Granted, they didn't even start construction until 2015, which was seven years after the bill was proposed back in 2008. Personally, I would love to see California finish their high-speed rail, but I think they're overburdened with environmental impact reviews to the point where you can't really get anything done in that state. Kind of makes me sad, but it is what it is, and it's a lesson to be learned. Hopefully, they'll have their initial operating segment up by 2029, but they really need to be serving the more populated areas rather than the Central Valley. Down in Florida, the private company Brightline is building higher speed rail. It's technically not high speed rail, but it'll take you from Orlando International Airport all the way to Miami. Brightline's leg up on California high-speed rail is the fact that they're a private company and they have to turn a profit. While Brightline may not be sending their trains down the coast at 200 miles an hour like California high-speed rail plans to, at least they actually have tracks laid and at least they're serving people as opposed to just having an idea that may or may not come to fruition. Their advantage is because they don't have to build trains that go 200 miles an hour, 110, 120 is fast enough for them, it reduces the cost significantly and makes it so much easier to construct. It's something to keep in mind. While ideally you have a train go as fast as possible, you need to be pragmatic about how expensive something is going to be and if you can finish the project on time. After all, California high-speed rail is estimated to cost $100 billion for that 500-mile segment, which comes out to roughly $200 million per mile. On the flip side of that, 
The Brightline extension, which was 150 miles, was estimated to cost somewhere between 2.7 and 4 billion dollars. Using an estimated figure of $3 billion, that comes in to roughly $20 million per mile, a factor of 10 less than that of California high-speed rail. On top of that, Brightline is actually running. In California, they've had more time to construct the rail, and yet they still don't have any trains running. In addition to those two, there's also UTA, which provides an excellent transportation option up and down the Wasatch Front. To scale down even further, there's also DART, BART, HART, and other metro systems that do an excellent job of transporting passengers within metropolitan areas. But I want to relegate the scope of this discussion to inner city rail, not necessarily commuter rail or metro systems. So in addition to those trains that exist in reality, there's also what I like to call the paper trains, the ideas that exist on paper. In a sense, California high-speed rail is a bit of a paper train because it doesn't serve customers and they don't have any stations built out yet. But a better example would be the Pacific Northwestern high-speed rail corridor from Vancouver through Seattle all the way to Portland, Oregon. It's a concept, but they haven't built anything out yet. In addition to that, there's Brightline West, which is planned to run from Las Vegas, Nevada to eastern Los Angeles. It's a concept, but no construction has begun yet. There's also the Texas High Speed Rail, which I hope gets off the ground, but I don't think it will. There have been talks about building high speed rail between Atlanta and Charlotte. Again, I hope it gets off the ground, but I don't think it will. So, there's all these paper trains, but there's something to be learned from all of them. And that's, you need to set goals that are realistic and achievable. The concepts that don't get off the ground, don't get off the ground because of two reasons. First of all, there's not enough impetus driving it. There's not enough willpower and there's not enough good management. Second reason is maybe the goal is a little bit unrealistic. It's better to do something that comes to fruition, like Brightline, than something that doesn't come to fruition, like California High Speed Rail. The last paper train that I want to talk about is the Front Range Rail that's supposed to run from Pueblo, Colorado, up through Colorado Springs and Denver, all the way to Cheyenne, Wyoming. This is an interesting concept because perhaps it could be linked to the proposed New Mexico Rail. Internationally, high-speed rail is a sight to see. I recommend you travel abroad and experience it for yourself if you live in the United States. If you don't live in the United States, I'm envious of the rail systems you all have at your disposal. In 1962, Japan built a Shinkansen. In the 80s, China built a Beijing-Shanghai high-speed rail and expanded its network to be massive. Over in Europe, the network is insane. It's absolutely beautiful how quickly you can go from town to town in Europe. Arabia has high-speed rail. Turkey has high-speed rail. All these places have high-speed rail. I am of the opinion that we in the United States have a duty to the subsequent generation to provide something like this, some big massive infrastructure project. This is promoting the general welfare and securing the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. So what are the benefits versus the drawbacks of each rail system? Maglev is the absolute fastest, but it's also the most expensive. There's the age-old trade-off of quality versus price, the higher quality system you have the more expensive it's going to be. The next thing we want to consider is, if not maglev, how are we going to power this train? Are we going to use an overhead cavernary and make this entire thing electric? Or are we going to use a diesel electric locomotive engine? The overhead cavernary is certainly more environmentally friendly, but that would involve electrifying miles and miles of track, which would involve building tracks solely devoted to carrying these trains. The next question we want to ask ourselves is, do we want to build track solely devoted to this higher or high speed inner city rail throughout the state of New Mexico? Maybe we do, maybe we have the money for it, maybe we don't. As an example for how much a system like this might cost, the estimate for California high speed rail is $100 billion for roughly a 500 mile segment. So it's roughly $200 million per mile. That might be a little bit expensive considering we only have a billion dollars earmarked. On the flip side of that, you have the Orlando extension of Brightline, which costs anywhere between $2.7 and $4 billion. Using the low end as an estimate, that comes out to roughly $16 million per mile, way cheaper than the California estimate. While yes, some of the track was pre-constructed, the rail is rated to go up to possibly 125 miles an hour. Out of sheer fiscal conservatism, Brightline seems like the more attractive option to me. It's definitely competitive with driving, but it doesn't break the bank and the project actually gets done. 
I think New Mexico should model its high-speed rail more after Brightline than California. So where would we put the stops for this proposed New Mexico high-speed rail? I think the project should be built in phases. The first phase would start out serving the most populous areas of the state, in this case Albuquerque and Las Cruces. However, because Las Cruces is so close to El Paso, the initial operating segment would start in El Paso, go to Las Cruces, and either to Almogordo or Truth or Consequences, then to Socorro, then from Socorro it could stop maybe in Las Lunas, but then stop in Albuquerque for that initial segment. An added benefit here is you could get off the high-speed train and hop on the rail runner to Santa Fe if you wanted. With the two termini in Albuquerque and El Paso, you would connect the three largest universities in the state of New Mexico. UNM, New Mexico Tech, and New Mexico State. This would help expand the educational opportunities in New Mexico and allow for better transit in between the universities as well. So before any contracts get awarded for this rail, we would need to negotiate some requirements and have them set out. Currently, Bill Souls' bill only requires that the route stops at the southern border of New Mexico and also stops at the northern border of New Mexico. While it's a good start, I think we should have more specific requirements. The first requirement would necessitate that the ride from Albuquerque to Las Cruces could be done in under three hours with the stops included. That way it would be competitive with driving. Additionally, allocating only $1 billion to build the entire length of the state isn't nearly enough money. The second requirement should necessitate that this train is compatible with the one that's also being built or planned on the Front Range in Colorado and Wyoming, so that eventually those two trains can be linked and the trip from El Paso all the way to Cheyenne can be made in one seat. So after that first segment is built, then the question becomes, where should we build the second segment? Should we build it north along the Rio Grande Valley through Santa Fe, up through Española to Taos, and then all the way to Alamosa, and then go over to Pueblo that way? Or should we stop in Albuquerque, head east towards Klein's Corners, go up through Raton, then stop in Pueblo to link up with the Front Range Rail. Admittedly, the Amtrak already runs through Las Vegas, New Mexico, and up that way. It becomes a question of, should we build new rail to serve more customers, or should we utilize the track that Amtrak already has? The downside to the first option is it will be more expensive to lay new track. The downside to the second option is passenger rail doesn't always get priority even though it's written into law that it should. Whichever way we go with this rail, there will be some mountains to traverse. However, I think it will be easier to go through Raton than it will be to serve Alamosa. That being said, going through Alamosa would serve more customers. Ultimately, having a system that would provide an excellent alternative to driving or flying would serve New Mexico taxpayers very well. Well. And if the system was designed to be compatible with a front range rail, it would serve not only New Mexico, but Colorado and Wyoming and Texas as well. So the next question we need to be asking ourselves is how do we bring this to fruition? Well, the first step is to call your local representatives. Call your state representatives and your state senators and say, hey, vote for Bill Souls' bill. The next thing that you need to do is push for requirements that stipulate a maximum travel time between Albuquerque and Las Cruces, or Socorro and El Paso. That way, the rail is competitive with driving. I think this project can be constructed. We have plenty of money in this state to do so, given that so much money comes from oil and gas. And ultimately, it would serve New Mexico very well. I hope we can bring this to fruition. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next video.